Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to another video. So today is an exciting day. We are finally off the iPhone recording. We're off the Windows old school editing. We are on 4K. Hopefully this is 4K when I edit it, or at least upload it. And we are starting to MacBook edit. So I'm excited. This is gonna be a great video. Can a guy get a like for some updates? So without further ado guys, let's get into the video. So to start off the celebration, we're gonna be doing a three part series today with our first video and we're gonna be talking about 15 things about Vietnam that a lot of people ask but a lot of people don't have answers for. So in this video we're gonna be talking about things like long-term living in Vietnam, tourist traps, the nightlife, working in Vietnam and the culture just to name a few. So in this video we're gonna focus on the first five things about Vietnam. So we're gonna be talking about work, dating, the nightlife, traveling around Vietnam, once you're inside of Vietnam, but actually traveling around Vietnam, and finally, going from a tourist status to a long-term expat status while you're living in Vietnam. So without further ado, let's kick this off. But before we get going, make sure you hit that subscribe button to follow along to get these other videos, and follow along on the playlist to get these updates as they come out. Again, we're doing three on this today. We're just gonna focus on one. So without further ado, let's get into the most important question always asked by Westerners, pretty much among us all, is dating to Vietnam. And that focuses around how, why, when, should you, and most of all, what to expect from actually dating somebody that is Vietnamese. So whether if you're looking for a one night stand, a girlfriend, or just something long haul like marriage, it's good to be ready for the unexpected. So let's kind of talk about what to expect on either of these cases. So it's good to be ready on day one all the way to the end of the whole process of your relationship with this person. Also, we're gonna kind of talk about where to find people that you wanna date, and also kind of what to expect when you get through the dating process. And also where to look to find good people to date, as well as what to expect when you're actually dating in Vietnam, as it is a whole different ballpark compared to our Western societies. Everybody has a reason for dating in Vietnam, be it good or be it bad, we just have our reasons. Finding that other person isn't too hard. It's just like anywhere else around the world, for say. In Vietnam, though, we do focus more on finding that person on places like Facebook, friends that you know, if you're using an app like Zalo, or even at work, or just a friend of a friend, or if you're at a coffee shop. So there's a lot of places to find people today, and it is pretty normal to do this. We can also go as far as saying you can find somebody at the nightlife. If you're on Bowie Vid or if you're at a club or at a bar, you can also meet people there. It can be a little different with the end results, but this is also something that a lot of people do that have value to it. Another probable way that you could use, and this one is kind of in the air, but is using Tinder. Tinder is something a little different, so let's kind of talk about that for a minute. Tinder itself in Vietnam kind of has its own purpose. A lot of people that you meet on there, what you're gonna find is a lot of them trying to find language exchange partners, or it's a lot of solicitation, which could be for apartments, for jobs, or looking for teachers, or it's just flat out sex. So my advice with Tinder, if you're looking for something serious, you might not find it on that site. There are other sites, so I think Plenty of Fish is one that's out there. I've had a lot of friends that have had success with that. But the idea with Tinder is it's almost like a solicitation site. It's kind of like TikTok out there. So I would avoid it if you're looking for something serious. You, you'll probably will get better results just going to a bar, a buoy vid than you would on Tinder in regards to finding something serious. So when you are looking for that perfect partner, you're probably having your, your standards, your preferences, and what you're looking for in that. So let's kind of talk about some things to look for in your partner. And again, I'm not sure telling you what you should date or who you should date, but I'm gonna give you some tips on what to look for and also some red flags to look out for in Vietnam. Married or dating a Western person in Vietnam for Vietnamese, be a guy or a girl, is a very big deal. It, it comes with a lot of benefits. So we wanna make sure we're finding something a little more real that we are as if we're just being a beneficial to them. So for me personally, I'm always looking for a good smile, somebody that's honest, that can hold a conversation, that's not asking too much about my job. Obviously, you're gonna get asked, like, what do you do out here? Are you a teacher? Do you own a company? Like, what is going on? But when that becomes the focus of the conversation, that's when I get a little weary. And again, I just look for a nice smile, somebody that can hold a conversation, that can go out. Again, there's gonna be a language barrier. But when their focus is really coming down to finances and when you're gonna leave, if you plan on getting married and taking your wife with you and stuff like that, these are the questions if you're getting them on the first or second date, which could be very red flaggish and make you want to really 
step back a little bit and be a little cautious of what you're about to step into. If you're looking for something long term, and this is really just trying to filter out the bad. The ones that are trying to get on that visa train. People that are trying to just get away out of the country in general by riding back with you. And just people that are just trying to scam you. Because this is a very common thing in Vietnam. And understand, if you go on Google websites or Google and you search Vietnamese wife, there are thousands of companies out there in Vietnam that are selling Vietnamese women for profit to Western people that aren't being aware of it. So be very careful and my advice again, look for the red flags, ask the questions, look at how they act, look at the body language. Are you finding a sincere person or are you finding somebody that's not sincere? And in my personal experience living in Vietnam for seven, eight years, I found sincere people that were serious about me, that weren't worried about where we lived or what I did or what my job was or how much money I had. They were just worried about me, David. If you're out in America dating a girl and she's constantly asking about your money, you kind of know where that's going to go, right? It's the same thing in Asia. It's just, in Asia, it's more direct. So in Vietnam, you're going to run into four types of girls. Very simple. And this isn't saying all of them. This is just the general four that I've read into and had friends who've read into as well. So number one, the honest hard worker. These are the girls that want to stay in Vietnam. They're working hard. They got their own job. Is If you've ever saw a Neo video, Miss Independent, this is her. This is a girl that you really want to focus on. This is... The first few girls I dated Vita were like this. They were just hardworking. They worked for big companies. They weren't planning on leaving, but they also weren't staying with their families or anything. These are strong, independent women. You will find these in Vietnam. Number two are the gold diggers. These are the ones that you're gonna run into a lot more than less. These are the ones that wanna stay in Vietnam, but they're trying to get that money for their family. It's the it's the daughter that's 20 years old marrying the 60 year old. And I'm gonna say this is always a bad thing. This isn't always an intent with them, but this is one of the categories you're gonna run into. You'll see a lot. Keep in mind, these girls do not wanna leave Vietnam. They are trying to stay to take care of their families. And that takes us to number three, kind of the opposite of that. They want to marry you to get out of the country. They, they want to move to Australia. They want to move to America or Canada. They want to marry you to get out of Vietnam. A lot of people realize what's going on in Vietnam and they know where the future is going to take them. So you'll meet a lot of girls that just want to marry you, get out of the country. Mind you, this could be a good thing for you. You, you got a wife, you got somebody to take back home. Cool, great. But understand when you get back to, let's say America, once you get married, she has power and she can leave you, and she can stay American, and she can take everything from you. So these are the girls that you have to really be careful with and do not make over the moment, at the last minute, jump decisions on. These are the relationships you wanna hold out for two or three years before you even consider that decision. So be very careful with the girls that are trying to marry for that visa card. And the last one, and this one is true, and a lot of people don't believe it, but this happens more in Vietnam than you would think. And these are the one night stand girls. These are the girls that are actually taking you out on a one night stand. They don't really want to date. They're not serious about anything. They don't want your money. They're, they're not asking you to pay them for sex or anything. They just want to have sex and leave. And they'll call you when they feel like calling you. They, they're not trying to get anything serious past a friendship with you. So this isn't a friend zone thing. This is actually like the golden ticket for a lot of guys in Vietnam. You just want a girl to sleep with that will leave you alone afterwards. Here they are. They're starting to become more independent and they are wanting to have that independence. So when you do find these girls, don't be that sticky guy that's always calling her and harassing her and bothering her and texting her. Just know she's there for you. But when she has the time, and again, these are just the top four that I've read into personally or the ones that my friends have read into while living in Vietnam. This is not the all of them. There are the rare few. There are other types of girls. These are just the top four that are pretty common in Vietnam. And with that being said, it takes us to our next idea, age gaps. And this is a very big thing that happens in Asia, mostly in Thailand, Vietnam, and the Philippines. But let's focus more on Vietnam, the age gap of the guy and the girl. The silly thing about age in a Western culture is if there's a huge age gap of, let's say 20 or 30 years, there's gonna be gossip. In Asia, it's an actual taboo. And it it's not talked about too much. If you're dating a girl that is 20, 30 years younger than you, her family isn't really gonna judge you based off the age. They're gonna base you off the character of your income at this point. It will be a common thing to see older men with younger women. You're not gonna get a lot of flack or heat from other Vietnamese people. When you do meet other Westerners, you bring your date with you to these restaurants. Let's say it's you and your friends, you guys are like 35, 40, your girlfriend's 22. They're going to give you a hard time. It, it, it's, it's mostly joking because we're in Asia, we get it. It's just what happens. You know, we have our reasons. Don't take it personal. Just understand that it is a taboo thing in Asia. It is a normal thing. Do understand in Asia, most Asian people will not 
in Vietnam really judge you based off the age. They won't make fun of it. They will, they will insult it. But when you see your Western friends, you are gonna get those jokes. So just be ready for it. Don't take it personal. And then the final part, married in Vietnam to a non-citizen. So do understand, if you do get married in Vietnam, most of the time how this happens if you're not married to a citizen, you're gonna get married through an embassy. It will not have any benefit to you in the country of Vietnam. This is a big misconception that a lot of people think, if I get married in Vietnam, even if it's not to a citizen, I will still have those perks as, as if I did marry a citizen. You will not have any benefits. You still will have to be on your normal visas. And again, this is something that comes up a lot because I hear a lot of people say, well, if I get married in Vietnam, I get a marriage certificate and stay in Vietnam longer. This is not true. You have to marry somebody of a citizenship of Vietnamese. Let's get on to the next subject, working in Vietnam. Being a teacher, being an engineer, being a wife, being a housewife, being a vendor selling bup sao day, you gotta get paid. So I wrote a book about four years ago for a couple of larger schools that I won't mention that went over the transition of transitioning into Vietnam as a culture. This book is gonna be a big part of how to successfully transition into working in Vietnam. No, regardless of what your job is, being a teacher or something else, it is a good way to transition because moving into Vietnam and getting used to it and working there can be a challenge within itself. So working in Vietnam comes down to three different types. The first one is you just, you're working illegally. You're working under the table. You probably don't have a degree. You shouldn't be there or you're under some kind of agent visas, which you can't really do anymore since post pandemics. They've kind of, the government stopped a lot of that. Or you're just working from Facebook jobs or something like that. And this can include being a teacher, being a YouTuber, being a nomad, selling bup sao, or just being a pimp. I don't know what you're doing. But whatever it is, you do not have an actual work permit to be in the country long term. The second one is, is more common for people that are working long term and expats is you got the actual work permit. You could be in Vietnam for two years at a time and just get the stuff extended as you're there, not having to leave the country. And finally, number three, you got married in Vietnam to a citizen and you have the actual marriage certificate and the extension of the visa so you can just work like a normal citizen. So in general, working in Vietnam is a pretty straightforward, easy thing. I recommend going through mostly Facebook as your best friend trying to find work in Vietnam. Even if it's to be an engineer at PV Oil in Vung Tau, they post on Facebook. So check that out. Make sure you have a good CV put together. Again, check out my book in regards to how to get ready for that stuff. And a final last word for Americans. I don't know if this applies to Australians and Canadians. I, I honestly don't know. But for Americans, every year we can file taxes in Vietnam and get a tax return. So if you do have a work permit or if you're married and you're paying taxes into the system, you can file taxes. Let me know in the comments below though if you're Canadian or Australian and this has happened where you can actually do too. As far as I know, only Americans can do this because I've been able to do it and nobody else has told me they could do it. And I think that kind of covers up the work. It's a very short subject. Again, check out the book if you want to know more about working in Vietnam. So let's get on to the next one. Traveling around Vietnam. Traveling around Vietnam is probably one of the best things I ever did in Vietnam. And my biggest advice to anybody living in Saigon or Hanoi, and it's been the same advice for the last seven years, is get out of the city and see Vietnam. Vietnam is a beautiful country. And the cities do not show justice to what Vietnam truly is. They're big cities, you know. They're gonna make them westernized. They're gonna be dirty. They're gonna be loud. They're gonna be polluted. But get out there and get outside. So traveling around Vietnam within the borders is an amazing thing to do and it's a bus. So to travel around Vietnam there's a lot of ways to do it. You could take a sleeper bus, you could take a boat, a ship, your motorbike, you could rent a bike, you could take the train. There's a lot of ways to travel around Vietnam. And you also have the option of taking ships if you're trying to go to somewhere like Phu Qua or you take the mountains around Ha Long Bay. So you definitely have a lot of options at your disposal to see all of Vietnam. But let's focus on the biggest one that we all mostly run into, and that's a sleeper bus. A sleeper bus is something that'll take you from city to city. So if you're trying to leave Saigon to another city or if you're leaving another city to another city, the sleeper bus is the best way to go. It is very cheap, it's affordable, and it gets you wherever you need to. A lot of them just go at night, so you can kind of pass out in them, hence the term sleeper bus. This is the best and most cheapest way to get around Vietnam and there's bus stations in pretty much every city where you can just select where you want to go, get your ticket, wait for the bus and it will take you 
wherever you're going. And you'll notice that I didn't really talk about taxis too much. Taxis are kind of a challenge in Asia for any Westerner because there's always a lot of scams. The drivers get lost. There's a lot of nonsense, stolen property. If you leave your photo there, they're gonna keep it and sell it to somebody. So the reason I left that out is because I think it's something you should avoid. If you are going to use like a bus or a taxi service, I strongly suggest using Grab or something similar to Grab where you can actually order it on your phone, get the prepaid price already on the screen and the driver they'll be able to use that app it will take them to google to navigate to where you're trying to go so they're not going to get lost you will be surprised how many taxi drivers don't know where to go or where anything is in their own cities so one thing that you'll start seeing as you travel be it in saigon a big city to hanoi all the way down to small cities like dalat or fontiet is the nightlife be it a big city or a small city there's always something going on so let's talk about the nightlife in vietnam so your style of a nightlife could be a combination of living the life on the Las Vegas Strip, going crazy all night, drinking and smoking and doing whatever you want to do, dancing it up and meeting the girls, or it could just be a, a calm night at a coffee shop with your friends relaxing. Whatever you like to do, I promise you, Vietnam and especially Saigon have this to offer to you. And the really cool part about this is every city has something going on that everyone has a little similarity between what they offer city to city. So the top five things that you can do in the nightlife in Vietnam pretty much come down to this. You have clubbing in heavy tourist areas. Then you have coffee shops that stay open just as long as a nightclub will, be it on the streets or be it inside their actual coffee shop themselves. You have the street food in Vietnam. This is a huge one. You have vendors everywhere. There is food everywhere, be it if you're at a park, if you're on the side of the road, if you're at a coffee shop or a club, there's always food to eat in the bigger cities. Even the small ones, it'll be limited, but there's always food around. And speaking of food, you always have a restaurant. Restaurants in Vietnam are almost like clubs. They're just not as chaotic, but you still have the option to go to a lot of fancy restaurants or just casual Vietnamese style restaurants that are going to be wild or they'll be calm. But the food, it's all about the food when it comes to what you do with the nightlife. So grab the food, check out the restaurant, be it street food or not, just grab the food, it's awesome. And finally, these are all things that are happening every night in Vietnam and everyone kind of has their own thing on what they like to do and they're all open for you. So pick what you like, pick your poison as they say and go for it because it's there. And like I said, a lot of this stuff doesn't close until 9 p.m., sometimes up to 2 or 3 a.m. Sky's the limit, do what you want, be safe out there. Don't be foolish, my friends. But be safe, but no, you have a lot of options. Say if you're going there to be a casual, go out at night, or if you're with your wife, your kids, if you're out with your girlfriend, if you want to go out and just party with the teachers and your friends, whatever you want to do, it is out there in the nightlife. And I can't stress it enough how many options you actually have to do whatever you want. When it comes to smaller spots like Nha Trang, uh, Fontier, Lagi, Dalat, you're gonna have a lot less. You're not gonna have the big parties. You're gonna have the coffee shops, the restaurants, the opening outs, the parks and stuff like that. But you're not gonna have a lot of the drug life or the party life. So you're gonna have a lot of open karaoke bars in the smaller towns compared to the bigger towns like Saigon. Saigon, you're gonna have the party bars. In the smaller cities, Dalat is a big one to talk about this one. It's a lot of karaoke spots, a lot of coffee shops. So. It, wherever you're at, you're gonna have something to do. If you know exactly what you wanna do, be it a heavy party or like a Vegas boy, get the site on. If you're looking for something to chill, anywhere else. And let me know in the comments below, where is your favorite spot in Vietnam? All of Vietnam, where is your favorite spot to go? Link us below, the Yelp review, whatever it is. Let us know where you like to go. But I will tell you my personal advice. And one thing I learned real fast is if you learn the language, you'll start learning where the Vietnamese go. And I think where the Vietnamese go is a lot more fun than hanging out with a bunch of teachers. Don't get me wrong, if you're gonna hang out with a bunch of Western people, teachers, and do these tourist stuff, it is amazingly fun. But there's a point when you wanna kinda chill out and you just wanna enjoy the country for what it is. Learn the language, at least the basics, make some local friends, and start going out with them. You'd be surprised what's out there. Some of the coffee shops I've seen were just on mountains overlooking the country. I remember we were in this spot in Lai Chau. It was a Vietnamese only known place and it overlooked China. And it just like the floor was glass so you could see down. It was an insane experience and I would have never found that if I was just hanging around Western people all the time. So definitely learn a language, meet the people. If you want to party like a rock star, hit yourself at the Saigon. If you want to see the real culture of what Vietnamese do, check out what the people are doing, make some friends. And with that being said, let's get into it. What is it like being a tourist and actually transitioning to an expat and being a long-term person in Vietnam? 
Despite what people might say about Westerners in Vietnam, there is a huge difference between a tourist Westerner or a teacher, for say, compared to somebody that's an expat. Even if you find the same teacher and the same expat in the same bar at the same time, you're gonna notice a difference between the two people. And this is a transition that we go through once we hit like that two, three year mark. And this is something we can see. When I go to restaurants, I can tell exactly what Westerners are doing. I can tell where they're from at this point. So let's sit down, let's kind of break it apart. Let's talk about what is that transition and what is it like and what is there to expect? So let's talk about how us long-term people in Vietnam feel, how we see things, kind of like our point of view of how we see life in Vietnam compared to somebody that's just coming by that's a backpacker or a tourist or they're just come in for a few months. So let's talk about four things that I went through personally as I was transitioning into this expat lifestyle. The first one was I started speaking Vietnamese. I, st I actually started learning Northern Vietnamese before I started getting the Southern down. And I started sounding Vietnamese. So when I was talking about Western friends, I would actually have like almost a Vietnamese accent talking to Western people. And they would kind of look at me like, you've been here for a while, haven't you? You're gonna start transitioning your voice, your language, the way you speak. You're gonna start saying, Chai, instead of just saying, oh man. Which is a good thing because you're becoming, you're evolving into the culture. Number two, we start avoiding tourist traps. We start avoiding the Western bars. And most of all, we start negotiating better. We start seeing how much something costs being fruit festival, a TV, whatever it is. And we start negotiating a whole lot better, not accepting to pay the Western price. But we know how to negotiate. And again, this kind of comes into speaking the language, understanding. If you can sell yourself as understanding the culture, the pricing you know, of what's going on, most Vietnamese won't argue with you. They'll give you what you want. This is a big part of what I transitioned is I started seeing the prices. When I saw a Pepsi cost 20,000, I was like, Joy. and I would go to the next store. And the idea here is I'm negotiating 25 cents, but this is just something that you start doing in Vietnam. So if you've been in Vietnam for a long time, you really understand this one. You start price checking stuff and a lot. Number three is kind of a funny one, and it happened a lot when I was talking to my mother, and it's that you start sounding Vietnamese. You start using weird accent sounds in English, which don't make sense in English, and you also start substituting some Vietnamese words in there. And it got to the point where even my mother was like, what did you say? Or I'll have friends that visit me that are from America or Canada or Australia, they'll come out to Vietnam and visit me, and I'll say things that are just kind of like Vinglish, as we call them, like it's Vietnamese-English mixed together, and you start developing that to the point where you almost start trying to speak Vietnamese over English. But this this happened for me because I started living in small villages like Lai Cho, Lao Cai, uh, Lazi, uh, the main city of Da Lot. Like I was in these in areas where it was strictly only Vietnamese. So my English started like going to the back of my head almost. And number four, my personal favorite, you start finding the hookups. You start finding the secret items on bid. You just start finding where to go. You start knowing the right people and the right businesses. This is a big one that is where Vietnamese people kind of distinguish themselves as being socially valued higher. You start knowing people. And when they're like, oh, I know Wade over here. Yeah, he hooks me up all the time. You start getting that status. And it's a really cool thing when you can start knowing where to go. Like you walk into a restaurant, I'll get some kam tam and I'll pay the normal 15,000 for it but the Vietnamese are paying 20. And they're confused, like, why does he pay less? I'm Vietnamese. And then they'll go up, be like, oh, this is David. He's from blah, blah, blah. He's been here, he knows this. And then I'll talk to that person in Vietnamese. So the cool thing about the expat status is you start becoming Vietnamese-ish in the community without actually being Vietnamese. And the people around you start justifying it for you, which is awesome because you start making really good connections. This whole subject though is very subjective. It's different for everybody. These are just kind of the four things that I went through as I was transitioning to expat. This is what I kind of realized like, wow, I really have been in Vietnam a long time. And it can be different for other people. So let me know in the comments below, like what was your transitional point if you've been there for three or four years? Like what, what made you feel like, oh Jesus, I really have been here a long time. And let's talk about those. In all, like it just felt weird when I was in that fourth, fifth year, I remember I'd be in, I would be in smaller towns and I would see a Western person being a white person or a black person drive by and I would just like double look at it and be like, wow. You know, like I, I felt like how a lot of Vietnamese people were when they see us, they're like, oh wow, because they don't see a lot of us in these smaller village areas. And when I see them pass through being backpackers, it was always kind of like, wow. And I started realizing like, Jesus, I really have been in Vietnam a long time. <laughs> when I'm looking at somebody that looks like they're from California, as like a rarity, you know? So definitely cool. Let me know in the comments what your little transitional point was. Cause I think, I think these are the fun parts of the subject because it's different for everybody and it kind of hits us differently. So let me know. So that kind of breaks up for transitioning from being a tourist in Vietnam to actually being an expat local. So let me know again below what, what your big point was from that. So I think that kind of does it for today guys. 
for our first five subjects. What do you think? Do you agree with these? Do you disagree? What, were, what would you have replaced mine with? Because I am very curious. We still have 10 more to go. But what do you guys think so far? So remember to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, follow along to see the next videos. There's gonna be two more going on with this one. And check out the link if you wanna check out the ESL book for teaching English in Vietnam and Asia. It's gonna be out here in a couple months. And don't forget to leave a comment, smash that like button, help our guy out. And until then guys, I am out. I'm out.